because mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you what, when you lose a dear loved one, like a spouse or a child, you yeah. can go through what's called acute grief for up to two years. Yeah. Easily. E easily. And so a lot of people don't know this and mm -hmm. they think, oh, I'm supposed to get over it. Right. No, you will not get over it. You will go yeah. Yeah. through it. Join the conversation and welcome to Inside Voice. Hello, my friends. I'm so glad you've joined us today. What's it like to be living your dream and then suddenly blindsided with your worst nightmare? On today's show, we're going to talk about the abrupt interruption of unforeseen tragedy and the trauma that follows. How do you pick up the pieces and manage to function when grief, trauma, and loss have knocked the wind out of you? Gina Pastore became tragically widowed when her husband Frank was struck down on his motorcycle after leaving the studio from doing his weekly talk show on KKLA, The Frank Pastore Show. Gina is the radio host of Real Life with Gina Pastore and David James, as well as an inspirational speaker and an author. And Gina, I want to welcome you, my friend. I'm so honored that you are here with us today, and I just can't wait for you to tell your story because I know somebody's going to be inspired. Well, I am so honored to be with you, my friend, and thank you for having me. And just right out of the gate, when you talked about yeah. living the life and living the dream and then mm. having some shattering event come along, I know there's so many people out there yeah. right now who can relate. Mm, it's so true. So many people are, you know, we're all success driven and we want to uh, experience life on the mountaintop, but oftentimes we get surprises that are, that are tragic. I've had my own share, fair share of tragedy in my life. And uh, I, I certainly know that you have processed so much and you're a deep well and, and I love you, my friend. Uh, I want you to take us back to um, the early days. Give us a little backstory on you and Frank, and tell us how you met, and uh, just fill us in a little bit. Well, I dare say it was it was pretty scandalous because <laughs> I and I, I never thought I'd be sharing this story publicly. I was often embarrassed of it in my latter years, but as time has gone on, I see how God is using the whole story. Wow! But I actually met Frank Pastore when I was just 11 years old, and he was a much older man of 15. Wow. Wow. I, I had heard his name in my house. I grew up in a loud, Italian, crazy household, <laughs> and my uh. father was kind of like the Tommy Lasorda of our home. And yeah. I had two brothers. My dad coached their ball teams. And so all I kept hearing about, though, when I was 11, was this Frankie Pastore, Frankie Pastore kid, because he had just moved to Upland at 15. Yeah. And he could throw really hard. So my dad wanted him on his ball teams. So wow. I, before I even knew this Frank Pastore, I had heard about him. But one night he came walk, bellowing through the front door with his loud voice and he was very full of life and gregarious and all that. And I was, you know, yeah. like I said, 11 and I wasn't romantically inclined or hormonal yet, but I, <laughs> wow, who is this guy? Who is this kid? And well, I was a kid, but. I was just so wowed by him and there was something about him and I didn't know what it was, but he just had me at 11. Wow. So, Amazing. Um, as, as things progressed though, um, he went on, he ended up getting signed his senior year mm -hmm. of high school. He played ball at an all boys Catholic school here in um, Southern California. And he signed at 17 with the Cincinnati Reds. And I was now 13, and oh. I had a crush on him. But I oh. thought, I'm going to go away and play baseball. I'm probably not going to see him again because some other girl will get him or whatever. And lo and behold, he came back that first, um, after playing in single A, came back that first off season and uh, asked my dad if he, if he could take me on my first date. Oh, so, uh, I went on my first date with him and I, I dare say I was beginning to fall in love. 
Oh, that's so sweet. I love that. And it's so organic. And so really, you guys started out very young together. And he his career started at a very young age as a major league baseball player. I mean, were there stresses that came with that eventually as, as life unfolded? Well, um, just to back up a little bit, mm-hmm. so we met on our, my first date. I went on my first date with him when I was 15 and yeah, he was yeah. 20. Or, I'm sorry, he was 19. And then the following year, he came back again from the off season. Now I'm 16. We go out again. So we're 16 and 20. And he basically, we go out and we basically decide we are in love with each other. So that's where the scandal came in. So he, you know, my dad really liked him. He was kind of like part of the family. And my dad was kind of like, if you touch my daughter, I'm going to break your (laughs) leg. You know, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, we started to get serious, and of course, then as we got serious, my mom and my mom was fighting with me because she thought that we needed to break up. This was going too fast, and I can understand her feeling. Yeah. <laughs> and I was fighting with her. Then my mom and dad started fighting, and so there was chaos in our loud Italian family uh, in my home. So. We did what any normal 16 and 20 year old would do. We decided that we would elope. Mm. My book, it's too long of a story to go into, but we elope and get married. Okay. So now it involves, I'll just give you a little snippet. It involves a police chase. It involves a (laughs) plane and going across the country. Oh, goodness. My father is looking for us and he, um, of course, alerts the Cincinnati Reds that one of their baseball pitchers has eloped with his daughter. So Frank was kind of like, my career is over. Oh, my. So to make to fast forward, though, we go to spring training that year. I'm now 17. Frank's 21. And he has the best spring training of any pitcher that year and Mm -hmm. ends up making it to the big leagues at 21 years old. Wow. So we're catapulted into this new world of mm. league baseball. And Unbelievable. Yes. So, yes, there were pressures and stress yeah. and, um, you know, long road trips, lots of beautiful women chasing after my husband and that kind of thing. Um, <laughs> Frank was a pitcher, so there was always stress about the pitching arm. Oh injuries and all yeah yeah thankfully during his career he ends up giving his life to the lord and becoming Mm. christian and i was raised very catholic so i didn't think i needed to do that right time i started attending bible study with him and realizing you know i've never really taken that step of committing Mm. my life to jesus and not a religion and mm-hmm. so I did that too. And um, at that point, our life became so focused differently. Both of us really felt the need to share the gospel. And um, we had our priorities right because early in, in Frank's ball career, we, you know, we were young and silly and became, you know, consumed with wanting more success and more yeah and all of that. So God had a way, though, of humbling Frank through an injury, which led to then him becoming a born-again Christian. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing what pain will do. And I know that was a painful experience for him, but the beauty that comes out of that pain, you know, and the, the rich reward oftentimes when we choose to invite Christ into the midst of that uh, that experience. And, you know, so fast forward a little bit and you experience some I- incredible pain um, in the loss of your amazing husband. And we've actually got a clip. We've, we've asked your permission ahead of time. And we found a clip on YouTube. Uh, Frank was uh, on radio. And that very day, he had no idea that it would be his very last broadcast. And he had no idea that he was giving an actual self-fulfilling prophecy in the broadcast itself. So we're going to actually play just a minute here from that clip. 
Let's go ahead and do that right now. Isn't it interesting that secular science is addressing the question, is, does man have a soul? Is there such a thing as immaterial reality? And it's couched in the category of, is there life after death? It's the same question. I mean, look, you guys know I ride a motorcycle, right? So at any moment, uh, especially with the idiot people who cross the diamond lane into my lane, all right, without any blinkers, not that I'm angry about it, but uh, at any minute I could be spread all over the 210. But that's not me. That's my body parts. Wow. Wow. I mean, it's just sobering to think about how those words um, – continue on uh, and will for all eternity. Um, God has used Frank on many levels to challenge people to know that there is a God, that we do have a soul, and that we, we will face eternity. And uh, Gina, that very day, you got a phone call that would absolutely change your life. And Listen, I know you as my friend, and my heart has just hurt for you over the years, but I've watched you carry this in such a graceful way. But take us back to that day. Uh, I believe it was in November when you got that phone call. It was November 19th, 2012. And I was actually standing in my kitchen making dinner. Frank would have, you know, thought, thinking mm -hmm. that my husband was going to be home yeah. around 8 o'clock that night. Mm -hmm. And I heard, I had the radio on. I was a Frank Pastore show listener. Yeah. And I heard him, he was doing an interview with a professor from APU University. And they were talking mm -hmm. about uh, the reality of the soul. And so Frank gave that as an example. Like he was saying, you know, tonight right. I can sit on the freeway, but that's not me. That's my body parts. Mm -hmm. And when he said it, though, I remember cringing, thinking, oh, I wish he wouldn't use that example because he had used wow. it a couple of times before when he had, you know, been doing the show. And so I, um, I cringed a little, mm -hmm. but I thought, oh, you know, and then I went back to my cooking and I forgot about it. Mm -hmm. So eight o'clock came. I'm expecting him to come bustling through the door ready for dinner and he didn't come yet. Mm. So I sat down and I set the table and I had everything ready by eight 20. I'm kind of, he, he had told me before he left that morning, he wanted to get home to see Monday night football. So, but I thought, Oh, maybe the professor that he had on stayed in the studio and they talked, you know, by eight 30, I'm now getting a little concerned. I'm getting that yeah. feeling that you get in your yeah. stomach. So by a quarter to nine, I did something I had never done before. I called the studio and to see if he had left. Mm -hmm. His producer was like, oh, he's not home yet? And I said, no. Mm -hmm. He said, no, he left right after the show. Oh. So, I, you know, I just had a sinking feeling. But to make a long story short, producer JJ called Caltrans and then phoned me back and gave me a number to call. Mm. He had called me, um, and we. I later found out the reasons why they didn't. They had a wrong number for me. But anyways, I ended up calling USC Medical Center and finding out that my husband had been airlift had been resuscitated and airlifted oh. USC Medical Center. So at that point, I just went numb, mm. and I felt like my whole life flashed before my eyes. I was having an out-of-body experience. I was actually going into shock. Mm. Um, Frank remained in a coma for four weeks at USC and then ended up passing away four weeks to the day later mm -hmm. on uh, December 17th, 2012. Yeah. And I was devastated. Oh, to say the least. Uh, I, I can't imagine. And I actually got a phone call from Paul uh, at that time. You know, we weren't married yet, but I got a phone call from him and he was totally shook up because Frank was his friend. And um, it, it was something that rippled throughout the community. Uh, he was just such a large presence and, you know, his, his uh, personhood. He, he was an inspiration to so many people. So having to deal then with four weeks of the question and four weeks of wondering, 
Is he going to live? Uh, am I going to lose him? Can you walk us through what it's like to be shaken? I know that these kinds of situations, they shake us to our core. They can shake our faith. They put us in a place of question with God. Why? Uh, what was that like for you? And, and how did, did you feel the presence of the Lord in, in those hours? Yeah, you know, it's so interesting because just thinking back, I can't tell you how broken I was as a person. Mm -hmm. I felt like my whole future became a blur because my whole adult life, even before my adult life, was wrapped around Frank Pastore. Wow. And we were very married in the sense that we were madly in love with each other. Yes, yeah. we did have some big fights and all of that, like good Italians do. Big Italian fights. <laughs> yeah. But we were crazy about each other. Mm -hmm. And I did not know how in the world I was going to live without him on this earth. Mm. And I remember at times even questioning the Lord when Frank was alive, like, Lord, I do I love you first or do I love Frank first? Yeah. And yeah. I, would, I would sometimes tease with the Lord about that. Mm -hmm. But so during this time, I tell you what, God and I, the Lord and I got really close. Mm -hmm. And it was the most painful time of my life. And yet it was the most spiritual time of my life. I just want to encourage anyone out there who's lost a spouse or a child or a dear loved one that, it is a time which the grieving process is profound. And I am a I now am dedicated to helping people go through their grieving process because what I learned as I went through it is how much we don't know about it and how little we are really taught about it and how little the church really puts into the whole grief thing. Yeah. You notice we focus on couples ministries, which is so important, but we right. do little the grieving people and so I'm really dedicated to that cause now oh I'm so glad because we need to hear more about grief and what it does to us I mean when we're traumatized by uh, a loss like this and especially I think when uh, you know whether it's sickness and it's a slow death or or something like this which is just tragic um, you know I've experienced those and uh, it can the body actually keeps a score physically of those traumas. And so we need to be hearing from people who have walked the journey before us and counselors who are experts with understanding how to process grief and how to um, acknowledge or confront that grief. And then how to be patient. Don't you think patience is a part of the process? Oh my goodness, totally. I remember years ago having a friend who lost a daughter and after nine mm -hmm. months, my friend was still crying. And I remember thinking, oh my goodness, she's still yeah. crying. You know, yeah. that's been washed out of the water for me now mm -hmm. because I'm going to tell you what, when you lose a dear loved one, like a spouse or a child, you yeah. can go through what's called acute grief for up to two years. Yeah, easily. E easily. And so... A lot of people don't know this, and they think, oh, I'm supposed to get over it. Right. No, you will not get over it. You will go yeah, yeah. through it. And yeah, so yeah. it's very important to know if you don't grieve properly, it will come back and bite you in the butt. And people don't know that. We stuff it down. And so this is where I think, too, that counseling can be very important. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm an advocate for going to good therapy if you need to. Yeah. Uh, make sure you're with a good Judeo-Christian therapist. And make sure you have a good relationship with your therapist. But it's vitally yeah. important that you walk through grief properly. Because if you don't, it can manifest through alcoholism, food addictions, stress, anxiety, sleep problems, all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Very Yeah, important. this is so important what you're saying, because what we bury alive, 
uh, and what we don't acknowledge and we don't process properly uh, can't heal. And I've said it many times, what we bury alive, uh, we will give power to that thing. And, uh, you know, I think we're living in a culture, Gina, that is, that that's just what people do. They are used to um, denial and burying things and moving on. And uh, so there's just this kind of whole performance uh, type of existence that we've grown used to and of, of a of right of a loved one but even yeah. trauma yes not encouraged i feel enough to get to the bottom of it and work yeah. through the process and that's really dangerous yeah. that's so good do you have resources uh at your website for counseling or how do you steer people what direction do you steer them now when they need counseling so um I never thought that I would be doing radio. Frank, my husband was the outspoken one. He was the broadcaster. He did yeah. television with your <laughs> call. He did his own radio yeah, show. Yeah. I was always behind the scenes. But the Lord, after Frank died, and this took this is another part of grief, is sometimes through your pain, you have to maneuver through and sometimes get out of your comfort zone. So right. the station, KKLA, offered me a, a Saturday night radio show. And my first response was, no, I no. <laughs> yeah. And I said no to God a lot. Uh -huh. After I left the station from a meeting where I said no, I was in my car driving home. And I felt okay. the Holy Spirit say to me very clearly, you always say no to me. And mm. I thought about that and I thought, I thought, yes, Lord, I do. I say no to you often, don't I? So I began to rethink my decision and I ended up stepping out on faith and I started a show called Real Life with Gina Pastore and David James. And I, the main reason that I did it is because I wanted my show to be a resource for people going oh. through tragedies and all kinds of cred that people go through. So that's awesome. really how my, my heart when I started the show. That is awesome. And it's doing very well. Is it a, a live show where can, can people call in? Do they ask questions? Do you respond? I'm hoping someday that it, it airs on Saturday night. So we do okay. take during the week, but I am hoping someday mm -hmm. I would love to do a call in show. So yeah. Oh, that would be I wonderful. That. Now the Holy Spirit may. <laughs> Yeah. Well, listen, those, those call-in shows can be pretty powerful too. And I think that, um, you know, this really points to just getting real. I love that the name of your show is real life, real oh, life with Gina Pastore. I think that we have, um, really kind of been in for, for probably generations, um, conditioned by this tendency to disconnect from anything painful. And so in order, in order to be um, somebody that people can actually heal with and relate to, we've got to learn to be vulnerable. And, and I'm speaking specifically to the, the Christian community right now. Um, you know, our pain is not who we are and it's not something to be ashamed of. It's, it's part of the human experience. And uh, my friend, Dr. Mark Sharona, uh, explains it so beautifully about this human experience and how that we are becoming more fully human as Christ was fully human. So as we spend that time walking through those valleys of the shadow of death, the things that we think are going to destroy us, the things that uh, we don't think we have the strength for, just like you, um, we find that we can have joy in the midst of our pain. We can have strength and there is a grace and he will carry us through those things, but he doesn't stop there. He does, he, he, he equips us to then be able to pass that on and pay that forward because somebody else in our life is going to need to hear that he's a good God and that he hasn't abandoned them. I think there's a lot of anger that can come whenever you're dealing with grief and loss. Did you experience any anger, uh, with anybody or with God during that time? Um, I did have some, but 
and I have during my grief process, I question God, like, why are, why aren't I more angry? Mm -hmm. Because I know that's a big part of grief. But honestly, yeah, yeah. I think in my case, my husband always reminded me in our marriage, our days mm -hmm. are numbered. We're here to share the gospel. He had such a focus on our wow. purpose that I think when he died, even though I was blown out of the water, I was somewhat prepared because he had yeah, prepared yeah. me for that. So I didn't personally experience a lot of anger, but I've met with so many widows that are dealing with that. And that is completely normal. God can handle it. The psalmist went to the Lord lamenting. And so a lot of times Christians are ashamed to admit they're mad at God. Right. And it's perfectly, God can handle it. He's a big yeah. God and he will walk you through that anger. The whole grief process does change us. I am not the same Gina Castori that I was the night that Frank had his last broadcast. I am a, right. very much a different person now. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. the beauty of it is that when you let God into the whole process and you take those little steps of faith out of your comfort comfort zone and you allow God to grow you, you will become a more fully human being, as yeah. your friend said. That's yeah. so good. What is your advice uh, about the issue of loneliness that people are suddenly dealing with? That's a great question. And it, it yes, I mean, I do have moments of profound loneliness, missing Frank so much. Mm -hmm. um, but it's so important to connect, to yeah, allow yeah. your friends, friends to be there for you, to be with you. Family members, church community is huge. I felt so bad during the whole COVID thing because yeah. so many widows and widowers and people who lost loved ones weren't, couldn't go to church and connect. Yeah. yeah. So that is very important. And again, sometimes when you're in those first stages of grief, you will feel like pulling away. But I and I think you do have to have times when you're alone and you cry. But right. not, don't do it for a long time and allow people into your pain. That's very important. That's really good. I think oftentimes people are afraid that they'll be off putting or it's too much and I don't want to be a burden, but we need to be able to allow people to come in and just sit with us. And and advice to people who are the friends and the family, I mean, that don't know what to say. Oftentimes they say things that are very awkward and insensitive, but not meaning to because they don't know what to say. Right. Could that, you speak to that? I can speak to that. <laughs> and what I would say is don't oh. say much. In fact, yeah. just be quiet. People mm -hmm. often want to give, I don't know, magical words that they think are going to make you feel better. Right. And it didn't make me feel better. Just yeah. having people, my friends and family sit with me, mm -hmm. cry, hug me. That's yeah. all I wanted. I don't want to yeah. hear, you know, for instance, something common that will say is your loved one's in a better place. Well, right. I, I already know that, right. first of all. But I'm yeah. hurting. You know, we have to remember Jesus yeah. cried over Lazarus. And he right. was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. But mm -hmm. he cried. He was mm -hmm. overcome by the sadness of Lazarus's mm -hmm. friends and family. So, and he himself missed him. So it's totally normal yeah. to yeah. want to say something, but just remind yourself, don't say. And, and you can say that. Say, I don't have the words. That's a good thing. Good. That's really good. Okay. I think that's very encouraging to our viewers today. Um, tell us about your book that you wrote as the sequel to Shattered. So my my late husband wrote a book called Shattered. Mm -hmm. And um, he wrote his book when he was doing his radio show and his career was taking off. And he often reflected on getting hit by a pitch by the... Uh, Dodger Steve Sachs hit him with a pitch and it ricocheted off of Frank's elbow mm -hmm. and shattered his elbow. Wow. And that changed his life. So an injury that changed his life spurred on this book shattered. So after he passed away, I felt led to do a sequel and kind of tell the rest of the story. So I did picking up my shattered pieces, bouncing back when life throws you a curveball. 
So in, in some way, I felt like I kind of completed our story by doing yeah. that. Yeah, so, it's yeah. like coming full circle. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I think you're amazing at what you're doing and uh, just the way you walk in such a grace and a strength that I know comes from the Lord and uh, from the integrity and the character of who you are. And I know that Frank is so proud seeing you and your kids continue to be that light for Jesus. And that was his heart. And that's our heart that, you know, everything that we do be bring glory to him. And um, there's somebody that, you know, I feel, I know you mentioned it a little earlier, but I feel today there's somebody watching that is um, has is dealing with a fresh experience of losing a loved one to an unexpected tragic death. And I, I just feel like you could minister to that person right now if you would take a minute to do that. Well, my I think the first thing I would say to them is let that pain that you're feeling and that grief, it 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 just has to wash over you like a tidal wave. And that's how it feels. It's a big emotion. But remember that God is going to buoy you through it. Mm-hmm. And the early days are really tough. But like I said earlier, let people in because they help to absorb your pain. You'll have friends and family and people coming towards you and just allow them to help buoy you through it. Mm-hmm. Um, don't isolate yourself, even though you may need time to be alone and cry in general, keep yourself connected as much as you can. Just try to live in the moment and handle what needs to be done in the moment. Um, you know, I found myself thinking, oh my gosh, my future's over, but then I would get busy with the matters that needed to get done. And that's important because Believe it or not, day by day, as you go through it, God will put the pieces back together. And pretty soon I'm, you know, nine and a half years out of my tragedy. And I can look back now and see how God was there every step of the way. Wow. That's, it's amazing. And he is so faithful. And he, you're, you said that so well. And uh, I just want to thank you for being with us today, for sharing your story. I know people would like to uh, listen to you on KKLA, and uh, I would imagine they can find your your radio program online. Is that correct as well? Yes, broadcast KKLA.com. They can listen on the Internet. You can reach out to me on Facebook, Gina Pastore Radio, or, or Instagram, Gina Pastore Radio. Awesome. And you're speaking as well. How can we find you? Um, Through my Facebook or my Instagram, send me a private note and I will get back to you. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, my dear friend. I really appreciate you. And um, it's just an honor to to lock arms with you and, and be ambassadors for Jesus in this time. It is. And now you have to come on real life, too. Oh, I'll do it. I would love to. It'd be an honor. So we'll do that. All right. And friends, I want to thank you as well. I know that some of you are really hurting and you're really dealing with some real pain, real situations. And I know that this program has been a word of encouragement to you today. So we just want to remind you, take it slow, take a breath and know that Jesus is right there with you and find a community that you can surround yourself with and know that you will get through this and tomorrow will be a better day. Thank you for joining us. I'm Brenda Crouch.